on uh, education reform, you refer to it reform as an achievement gap bill. And you'd be interested yes. in getting a little bit more understanding why um, why you see it that way, and uh, you can also talk a little bit about and address the concerns that teachers and yeah. the teachers unions yeah. have about uh, the bill. How can I answer this answer? Right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the meanest one. Um, okay. Well, uh, I mean, that is the title of the bill. Also, you know, I didn't just make that up, but. Um, Several, I mean, look, this is something that I ran on. It motivated me to decide to run in the first place as a former teacher. And this is, a, I think, our most urgent uh, challenge facing us uh, in our schools is the issue of achievement gap uh, for low income students, for students of color, for English language learners uh, across the board. And so I come to the table with a great sense of urgency and a, and a belief that it is my responsibility as a senator from this district to maintain that sense of urgency even though I'm in the bubble in the state house, right? Because every year that we kind of talk about it and say, well, we got to get this more perfect, we got to get that more perfect, more kids are dropping out and more kids are passing through the system. And that's their life, right? That's their time in school. And that's their you know, last year to get a, a turnaround and to get the service that we promised them as a society. And so every year that we fail to do something is a major failure. Uh, of our responsibility as policymakers and as a community. Uh, so that bill was not perfect. You know, I, I had, I still, you know, have, uh, I have problems with some of the things that were in it. They were not as I would have put in the bill. Uh, but I voted for it in the end because I think the things that we got from it are more important. Uh, and taking that active step is more valuable and it's a, it's a positive, the, the, the positive outweighs the negative, right? Uh, and that we have to do something. I, I'm not going to stand by and just vote no and say, well, we need to wait for a more perfect solution. Uh, so, you know, and there's several things in the bill that were good that didn't get talked about because they weren't controversial, right? Because everyone agreed that they were good. Uh, as an example, uh, when we just, you know, when a school gets deemed underperforming, one of the things that has to get built into the turnaround plan for that school is a plan to address not just what's going on within the four walls of that school, but it also has to address something that we all know instinctively which is that uh, the world outside that school also has a huge impact on that student's life and on that student's performance. And so the plan also needs to address how are we going to solve the health and welfare needs, or not maybe solve, but address, right, the health and welfare needs of that student and their family. How are we going to address the safety needs of that student and their family? How are we going to address the uh, workforce development needs of that student and their family, right? Because if you have parents who are working two, three jobs, to put food on the table and just to survive, and they're not going to have enough hours at home to help their kids with their homework, know who their friends are, and have that teamwork relationship with the, with the schools. You're not going to get to admission, right? So looking at the, the larger picture is something that Bill calls for that never got talked about in the press, um, and it also puts in place a more rigorous timeline for turning around schools, and that's something that I really believe was important to do because uh, we can't just continue to say, well, that school's failing, but let it languish. So that's what I like about it, you know, not how I go over time. Uh, the things that I have problems with, I worked really hard, I pushed very hard, uh, both as an education committee member and on the Senate floor to, um, and this is very wonky, uh, get into the bill something that's called the growth model. And this is a, you know, very numbers driven, data driven thing that the Department of Education has recently developed to, to recognize the value added, let me try to just boil this down, to recognize the value added that a school and that teachers um, add to a student's education from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, right? Because what we know is that uh, it's easier for oftentimes for schools and suburban districts to get great high test scores because students come in at the beginning of the year already, you know, above grade level in reading and having all of these additional supports outside the classroom. And so, it, you know, we don't know without doing this growth model equation, right, whether the reason they got a high test score is because their teacher was so great or because they had all of this other stuff and the teacher didn't actually add any value, right? And similarly, it's hard to tell just by looking at the raw test score whether it was low in the case of some of our schools here in urban districts because the teacher didn't do a, a good job and didn't work hard and wasn't committed uh, or because they were sh swimming upstream and they did a tremendous job but the, the student started five grade levels behind in reading or doesn't have whatever supports they need at home, is coming to school hungry, whatever it may be. And so we need to look at the question of value added so that we can treat teachers fairly uh, and assess them more fairly, right? We need to assess students fairly, we need to assess teachers fairly. And if you're gonna put all these consequences in place, which 
uh, you know, to a certain point, I'm okay with. Like, uh, going outside the contract, you know, in extreme cases, right? If you have a school that's been failing for years and years, if we're going to have extreme consequences like that, we damn well better make sure that the measure is fair. Uh, and that's what the growth model was about for me. And there was a lot of opposition to that. In the end, it got taken out of the bill. I'm going to continue fighting for it and to push the, the Department of Education. And they have latitude to use it anyway, even if it's not in legislation. Uh, so we can push through the, the administration, or we can continue to fight to get it into legislation. I think we have to do that. Yeah, um, just we just did on the bio level four. Yeah. Um, this is a, an issue that's gone a little bit quiet over the last couple of years, but it was a big issue uh, on, this, on the end a couple of years ago. Uh, and my position is the same, which is this, that I uh, am very uncomfortable with the idea. You know, I, I would not go so far as to say 100% never ever, right? Because I, look, I think we need to be driven by science on this one. Uh, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm the daughter of a scientist. So, I, you know, I was raised with a healthy respect uh, for being data-driven about things. And also, you know, on the principle that science isn't just one study. Right? It's a basic principle in the field that you need to have replication of results in order for something to be um, you know, taken as true and, and a, you know, a credible result. So if, there, if, we had, if we had a scenario right, where multiple studies that really looked into the issue confirmed that this could be done safely in a dense urban environment, uh, like you know, the site that's proposed in, in the South End, I would look at that. I would really have to look at that. I don't think we have ever seen that. Uh, so I remain very sensitive. Yeah, is there a question out there? Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, you focused in your uh, youth uh, violence uh, answer on funding. I know that the mm -hmm. did a lot of work on funding. Maybe you can talk a little bit about why the funding is uh, yeah. for jobs is in particular yeah. is the most important, or if you think that's the most important way to chip away at the youth violence yeah. uh, problem that we've seen here. Yeah. Just in Jamaica Plain recently. It's not the most important. But I only had a few words. So. Right. <laughs> um, and I, did I also mention guns? Um, I don't think you mentioned guns. Okay, well then I'll, I'll mention them. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's sort of the three basic principles that, that I use as a guide for policy um, for how we, need to, how we can address youth violence. One is uh, increasing young people's vision of their future, right? And, and increasing their hopeful vision of their future and their actual belief that that is a reachable, credible future for them. Um, because when you have so many young people who just who don't believe that they're going to be able to access college, that they're going to be able to have whatever job that they're inspired by, like so many of our parents told us, if you don't believe that's really going to happen, you see a lot of, that this is what drives a lot of young people to drop out, you know, if they just don't think their efforts are going to make a difference, uh, you drop out, you get onto a negative path, and there you go, right? So we need to actually make those visions uh, real for young people. And that involves a whole host of things, right? A number one, our K-12 system, right? And kindergarten and pre-kindergarten. Um, and that's not a sexy answer, but it's our single most important tool. Um, that and parents, right? And then that gets to the second principle. Uh, so it could be jobs, it could be after school programs, it could be yep, recreation programs like the CAS facility, uh, and it's our K-12 system. Uh, the second principle is increasing young people's uh, relationships with caring adults. Uh, and that, again, you get through a variety of sources. You get it through the K-12 system, you get it through after-school programs, through summer jobs programs, through year-round jobs programs, through mentoring, um, and also for parents, right? And this is uh, where, for me, uh, issues that sound disconnected from youth violence, that sound disconnected from education, like minimum wage policy, become really important. <coughs> They're already important on their own, in their own right, but this is a huge moving piece in my mind of how we get parents uh, supported and able to do the work of parenting and education. When I was a teacher, it was a good night on parent-teacher conference night if I had 50% of my parents show up. And it's not because 50% of them did not care about their kids. It's because you have, you know, so many of them have to work two, three jobs to put food on the table and they physically can't be at the conference or the language barrier in many cases for parents. So we need to solve both of those problems. Uh, again, to increase the, the caring relationship with, uh, with adults. And then the last one is guns. Uh, for me, the first two are much more important. Prevention, we're going to get a lot more bigger results out of prevention. Uh, but we should not ignore uh, the gun supply problem, right? Because we, we need to be asking ourselves, as the campaign says, where do the guns come from when we see 14-year-olds picking up guns and shooting one another? How the heck does a 14-year-old get their hands on a gun in our neighborhood? And it is way too easy. 
So one of the bills that I proposed this year, and I will continue to fight for next year, and that the governor also proposed like legislation, is to restrict the flow of, uh, of supply chain uh, into our neighborhoods. Uh, and there, there's a whole variety of ways that you do that. One is by cutting, uh, by track, better tracking the secondary gun sales market. People are required to report when they uh, buy a gun at a gun store, but there are loopholes when they give the gun to someone else in a request, or they just give it to their buddy, or they sell it at a you know, second hand. Um, so we need to tighten up those loopholes so that our tracking system works better. And we need to make it so that it is much, much harder uh, if not fully impossible for people to buy guns in bulk and then resell legally and then we sell them on the illegal market. And we know that this is a source for illegal guns in our neighborhoods. I have one other post too. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand this question, so if you don't either, which guys if you can clarify it. How much of the million went to our district summer jobs? Oh, that's a, yeah, I mean, I understand the question. Uh, that's a great question. I confess I don't know off the top of my head. The, the I mean, and it wasn't just a million in the end. It was a million increase, right? So that made five million in total. Um, and all of that money is targeted to high-risk areas. So Boston is going to receive a very substantial chunk of that, but off the top of my head, I don't know the exact dollar amount. Whose question was that so we can follow up and find out? Can, um, I just want to... Uh, point you out to Winston in the back from my campaign. If you give him your contact information, we'll find out the answer for you. Um, all right. Can you talk a little bit more about your position on charter schools? Uh, I'm concerned that so much focus is on a few kids um, who opt into charter schools, while most of our kids uh, will probably always will be in uh, regular district schools. How can we increase innovation and achieve charter schools? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. There's a lot of things that we can do there. I mean, one of these is really, um, we. The, the Department of Education and the school districts need to get uh, more aggressive, I believe, on charter schools and on district schools, frankly, to come to the table uh, to make sure that those, that those uh, best practices and those innovations that are, that are proven uh, effective are getting transferred. Because the whole point of charter schools, whose question was this, just so I can actually speak to the person. Oh, there you go. Uh, that you know, the whole point of charter schools in the first place was for them to be uh, laboratories. Right? and engines of innovation. And so let's get back to, to, to principle one here uh, and make sure that they're fulfilling that purpose. Uh, and, to put, and right now, you know, I don't, we don't have really concrete systems in place to make sure that's happening. It's sort of ad hoc. Uh, so that's something that we do need to continue to work on. Um, but it, it takes two to tango, right? And the really, I'll be, let's be blunt here. The relationship is not great uh, between charter schools and district schools. And I think there's, you know, we, it's going to take time to um, bring those relationships to a place where people are going to be willing to exchange ideas and, and actually put them into practice. And look, it should not be a one-way, uh, it's not only charter schools that have things to teach district schools. There are a lot of best practices going on in other district schools uh, that we need to make sure that there's a rich transfer of those best practices from district schools that are working to district schools that aren't. 